welcome back to our fourth segment of Heavy Gear Blitz. This one is going to be a little bit more rules intensive. We're going to talk about movement. So that key aspect of getting into position in order to be able to do the fun stuff, which is blow your opponents away. All movement in Heavy Gear Blitz is divided into three general bands. So these bands are stationary, which if you're stationary, it is represented by these handy dice, which my helper here is going to show you. This is the stop or stationary. You then have what is called combat speed. So combat speed is where you're moving at a pretty much engagement speed. It allows you to fight relatively effectively, uh, makes you average to hit and so on. The last speed is called top speed. And top speed is where you're doing nothing but moving. So as you can imagine, top speed is the fastest speed and it is going to get you places, but it's gonna cost you combat effectiveness. So three range bands of movement, which are stationary, combat, and top. And we'll talk more in detail about how these affect how far you can move in a second. All right, so we talked earlier about each of the different movement bands. So here we're going to talk about how you change movement bands and what each one looks like. So currently, as you can see, our Sidewinder friend here is currently stationary. Now, when you activate a model, we talked about activating earlier, you can choose your speed band by shifting up or down one speed band. So currently our Sidewinder friend is stopped. That means he could shift up to combat speed or he could stay stationary. It would be his choice. He could not, however, go from stopped to top speed. It would take far too long in the scale of time that this game represents. So let's talk about stationary. Stationary allows a gear to move anywhere from zero to one inch. So as you can tell, stationary is not very fast, which makes sense. The, the next combat, uh, speed is combat speed, which allows gears to move up to their combat speed. So one inch is the minimum move up to their combat speed. Most combat speeds of gears will fall into the range of five to seven inches. So they will have a decent amount of speed. The last speed band, which is top, is very fast. In most cases, it almost doubles your speed. So whereas this guy could have moved seven at combat speed, he could move 14 at top speed. So 14, as you could tell, is quite far for movement. Now you're probably wondering, well, why don't we just always boot around at top speed? Well, top speed is going to cost you your action for piloting. That means you're not going to be able to shoot in a single action model, which is most gears. You're focusing solely on driving your gear and not running into things. So you're basically moving from point A to point B and you're ignoring most other things. The advantage of top speed is that you're typically much, much harder to hit as opposed to a gear that is stationary, which is really easy to hit because stationary targets are easy to hit. That makes sense. So we're gonna reset our Sidewinder back here. And I'm going to show you an example of turning. So turning, all turns are 60 degrees. So on most gears, you'll notice that they have a hex base. So a single turn is a single hex facing on the base. So my assistant here will demonstrate a one hex turn on our Sidewinder friend here. Now in the rules, it basically says, um, you know, be fair, uh, don't be super generous, don't be super stingy, it's a fun game. So basically when you do hex facings, you can grab your guy and go 60 degrees, okay? So what I will do is I'll get my assistant here to show a movement example 
at, say, combat speed, where our Sidewinder is going to do a little bit of movement forwards, and he's going to execute a 60-degree turn, and he can keep moving after his 60-degree turn. <clears throat> okay, that would be a very basic turn example. Now, you're probably wondering how many turns you can do. We're going to talk about that in a sec here, as far as um, the different movement types go. I do want to mention at this point that when you are moving models, you may always move through friendly models. So this means your squad mates get out of the way and you're not going to do all kinds of collisions with them. So you can get out, move through friendly models, which is nice. The other restriction is if you are moving at top speed, you cannot switch what is called movement types. And I'm going to talk about movement types in the next segment here. But be aware for now, you cannot change uh, movement types at top speed. You can change movement types at combat or ground speed if you're moving slower. Okay, so in this section we are going to talk about the different movement types. So as you know, in warfare, not everyone gets around in the same method. So here we have two radically different models. We have a gear and we have a hover tank. So as you can tell, the propulsion systems are different. One looks like it's running, the other is quite clearly hovering. So we're going to talk about the most common form of movement first, which we're going to focus on our gear, and we're going to focus on walking movement. So as you can tell, anything that has legs is going to have a walking movement. Now, what is walking movement good at? Walking movement is good for negotiating difficult terrain, because if you think about it, if you can walk through a forest, it's much easier to navigate than a set of wheels or a floating hovercraft. So walking is going to reduce terrain penalties, and we'll show you some numerical examples at the end of this video. But for now, know that walking is good for navigating terrain. The other thing that walking is good at is if you're moving at combat speed, you have free movement. So you have an unlimited number of turns with no minimum turn movement. So that means you could take your guy and he could move any direction he wants to simulate that, well, when you're walking, you can simply move wherever. At top speed, however, with walking, you're a little bit more restricted. So at top speed, you can make one turn for every two inches of movement. So you could move two, execute a 60 degrees, move two, execute a 60 degrees, and so on, up until his maximum top speed. So walking movement, very, very good for negotiating terrain, um, and very, very mobile. Drawback of walking, walking is slow. So I'm gonna get my assistant here to reset our Sidewinder back to combat speed. And we're gonna talk about the, what is often referred to as the secondary movement system. This is wheels. So they've been around for a few thousand years. The nice thing about gears is they have a set of wheels tucked under their um, feet, essentially. So if you actually look at the models, and I'm going to put a model on camera here. So if you actually look down below at the uh, model, you can actually see that they have heavy duty wheels on the bottom, which allows them to use their secondary movement system. So what is the advantage of a secondary movement or ground system? The good thing about the ground system is it is fast. To give you an example, most gears move four while walking at combat speed. This gear would move seven at ground movement at combat speed. So you're faster. Well, that speed comes at a cost. There is always a minimum movement for ground speed. If you think about it, it's much harder to turn something on wheels than it is to uh, walk in any direction. So at combat speed, you can execute one turn for every two inches of movement for a ground. So this is going to look very familiar with top speed uh, with walking. The advantage is you can typically move further with ground movement. Okay. If you happen to be moving at top speed for your ground movement, 
it means that you take even longer to turn. Why? Because you have so much momentum that you're moving forward, it takes longer to turn. You have to move three inches in order to execute a single turn. And you'll notice here that this means that if you're doing circles to try to reposition, you have a much, much harder time maneuvering into position. So you're fast, hard to maneuver. There is also one other downside to this. Driving through terrain features is difficult. That means it costs you a lot of movement to get through things like forests. Just imagine trying to drive your car through the tropical jungle. Obviously, it's going to be hard to do. So if you're on your wheels, so you're moving slowly through your things like terrain. On the flip side, you move very fast on flat terrain features like roads. So it's the trade-off between the two uh, movement types. So these are the most common ones. The other one that you are going to see is the hover movement type. Now, these guys use a uh, variety of different technologies depending on the faction in order to achieve hover. In general, they're hovercrafts and air jets. They're not the anti-gravity uh, kind of sci-fi super tech thing. They're actually honest to goodness hovercraft. So what is great about hover? Hover is super fast. It allows you to move faster than any other movement type. A good example of this is this tank at combat speed would move 10. If you remember the other guys, four for walking, seven for ground, 10 for um, hover combat movement. That is a huge amount of movement. Okay, so that was good. The other awesome thing about hover movement is it allows you to ignore most terrain types up to an inch in height. So that means if you were to have your hover tank and you were to have something like this hill in your way, you could simply hover over that hill in a straight line going forwards. You don't even have to stop. You just fly right over that piece of terrain. So anything that is a low piece of terrain, you can basically just jump over up to an inch. So that's very cool for moving fast and getting into position. All right, are you ready for the downsides of hover movement? The downsides are you have low maneuverability. Remember that idea that if you're really fast, it takes a long time to turn? Hover is really bad for that. So if you're moving at combat speed, you are going to have one turn every two inches, and we've seen this done before. The one I want to demonstrate right now is top speed. If you're at top speed, you get one turn every four inches. Now, that is incredibly um, slow for making circles. It means you cover a lot of ground, so you might cover, say, 20 inches in your movement turn, but your executing of turns is going to be very, very slow. Other downside, because you knew it had to have another downside, is moving through certain terrain types, you simply cannot do. When we talk about terrain, you're going to have things like jungles. You can't drive a hover tank through a jungle. It just does not end well for your hover tank. So there are certain terrain types that if you can't hop over, you just can't enter. So hover is fast, low maneuver, but um, you have some downsides as well. The other kind of movement that I'm going to briefly mention is what's called static. This is things like defenses, which don't move. So really, I don't need to say anything more than that. After this section, we are going to talk a little bit about uh, terrain and how it interacts with movement, and we'll do some movement examples. All right, so more on movement. This would not be a tabletop game if we did not have different types of terrain. So on the board, uh, we have a total of 10 types of terrain. I do not have them all represented here, but you can look inside of your heavy gear book and it tells you a little bit about each terrain type. To give you a, an example, you could have things like forests. You could have things like solid hills. You can have things like ridges. You can have other things like uh, sand, buildings, roadways, jungles, and so on. So there's 10 different terrain types. Um, in general, you should talk to your opponent before the battle about designating what kind of terrain each one has. Why is this important? Well, two reasons. One, because it affects 
how much movement it takes to get through various terrain types. So a light forest takes a lot less movement than a dense jungle. The other thing is you want to designate any terrain that is potentially dangerous ahead of time with your opponent. So for example, this forest may not look dangerous, but say your opponent thinks that there is a whole bunch of old landmines in that forest. They may want to classify this terrain as dangerous. So how does dangerous terrain work? When a model moves into a piece of dangerous terrain, they take a threshold test. So you remember these from our earlier video. They take their piloting skill for defense. We'll say two, they roll, and they're looking for a threshold of five. So did this guy make it? Clearly he didn't. He rolled a four and his threshold was five, so he failed. So he would fail his dangerous terrain test and he would take a little bit of damage. The other thing that you wanna do with your opponent is talk about difficult terrain, which is less than dangerous. It's a threshold of three instead of a threshold of five. And you can usually avoid most difficult terrain if you're moving slowly through it. So this has been an example of dangerous terrain and various terrain types. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about movement examples. All right, so we have movement example one. In this case, we have our sidewinder, which is moving at combat speed, and he is walking. So as you can see by the dice, he is walking combat speed. His combat speed is four. So he must move anywhere between one and four inches. Now you'll notice he is headed for a forest. A forest is harder to navigate than a open ground. So walking through a forest, you would look at your terrain types. I would look at a forest which is considered dense terrain. And it costs three points of movement for each inch that he wants to move through that forest. Now, if you remember me talking earlier about walking movement reducing penalties by one, it would normally cost him three. It only costs him two. So he has a total of four inches of movement. So he is going to move an inch up to the forest, would take one inch of his movement. He has three left, so he could move an inch forward into the forest, costing two. And then he has one point of movement left, so he gets a extra inch. Okay, you remember me saying you round up for fractions. So he would actually get that extra inch of movement moving into the forest. Now, that was pretty quick if you think about moving and walking through a forest. Now, I want to talk about a drive through the forest. So I'm going to get my assistant here to reset our fellow moving through the forest. And this time, he is going to be moving at his secondary movement system. So what happens now is he is driving through a forest. So a forest is dense terrain. He's going to move his one inch up towards the forest. He has a total of seven inches. So one inch on the ground is nice and easy. It only costs him one. But now that forest is gonna cost him three inches for every inch that he wants to go. So he is going to cost three inches for the first one and three inches for the second one. So that was his entire movement. So if you think about it, it's very hard moving through a forest on your wheels. So whenever you're going into difficult terrain like a forest, you want to consider walking as opposed to driving, unless you have very, very fast driving movement. Now, the other thing that we're going to talk about here was that was an example of a forest. I'm going to show you the converse example of this. We're going to remove these trees and we're going to simulate this as a patch of very soft Ground. Now, you will remember me talking about walking is fantastic for difficult terrain. Not so for walking in sand. It actually costs you additional movement to walk through sand. So sand is rough ground, so normally it costs you two, but if you're walking it costs you an additional inch, which means in this case you'd normally have four, which means his first inch costs him three, and then he has not even one point left. He needs three, so his fraction would be rounded down. He is done moving. So if you look, he moved a whole inch through that rough, um, soft sand. Now, if he was driving, driving is actually easier to get through sand. 
So he's driving. He has a seven movement pool. He does not suffer a penalty for driving through that rough sand. And it costs him two inches per inch traveled. So he could go three forward, which would cost him six. And then he has one point left, rounding up your fraction. He gets an additional inch. So if you look, he actually moves quite fast if he is driving. So different terrain types, you want to consult your chart always before moving through different terrain. Uh, this has been our movement example. We are now going to look at some more oddball examples, such as climbing. All right, so we're going to talk about climbing in this example. So climbing can be done by any model under certain conditions. So the first kind of climbing is when a model comes up to a elevation that is one inch or less. So imagine we have this fellow here. He is gonna come up to this elevation. He is going to check how high that elevation is. So that elevation, if you look, is roughly an inch in height. Again, be, be relatively generous with these things. So it's a roughly an inch in height. It costs him one movement point to climb up one inch of elevation. It is that simple for things that are an inch or less. However, imagine our fellow comes up to this section here. This section is quite clearly taller than an inch in height. If a model wishes to go up more than an inch in elevation, it must have arms. Because if you think about it, this makes sense. You need to climb. If you do not have arms, you may not climb. So our gear is lucky, he has arms. He would need a skill test in order to climb this cliff. So cliffs are considered difficult terrain and you need a threshold of four for climbing this hill. So he would roll his dice and assuming he's a regular skilled pilot, he is super good at climbing. As you can see here, he rolled a seven. So he would be able to climb up that cliff. It would cost him one point of movement for every inch that he was climbing. So as you can see, having arms allows you to be very, very mobile. If he did not have arms, for example, our Naga friend here is attempting to climb up this hill which is larger than an inch, this Naga does not have arms. If he was attempting to go through that hill, he would ram into the hill and suffer damage, which makes sense if he's attempting to go at 50 clicks an hour and runs into a brick wall, well, bad things are gonna happen to him. So that was an example of climbing. We'll be back with more examples here in a second. Gamers on Games is sponsored in part by... This episode was brought to you by The Mythwits, a geek pop culture talk show. Every week we interview an industry guest and make with the funny. Check us out at Mythwits.com, YouTube, and iTunes, and watch us live every Monday night at 9.30 p.m. EST.